our stoichiometry video. Um, most of this should be re a review of pre-AP stuff. There's one thing that's new, the empirical formula from combustion that we'll get to in just a sec. But the majority of this should be a review. It's a really, really quick review. Remember that a chemical equation represents any time that a reactant chemically changes into a product has to be balanced. You have to use symbols to indicate your states. And on the AP exam, all of your equations are written as net ionic equations. So you are going to have to memorize the solubility rules. I know I didn't make you memorize them in pre-AP, but this is a whole new ball game. So memorize your solubility rules. This down here would be an example of a net ionic equation where you have carbon dioxide and ammonia um, reacting with water basically would bubble up both of these gases through water and the resulting product would be ammonium carbonate um, which would have the formula NH42CO3 uh, if it were a solid but because this is aqueous it will ionize into the two ammonium ions and the one carbonate ion so you would write the equation like this not with your product written like that. Um, so just practice balancing this following the this reaction right here. If you've had me before, you know Mino. If you haven't, you don't know Mino. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Mino stands for metals, polyatomic ions, nonmetals, oxygen, hydrogen, and this is a nice kind of helpful way to to remember the order in which to balance your chemical reactions. So I'm going to balance all of my metals first. So looking at my reactants, I see that I have sodium. I have one sodium on this side. I have two sodiums on this side, so I need to put a two out front right there. Then I'm going to balance my polyatomic ions that go from the reactant side to the product side without changing. And so I see that I have a sulfate. And so I'm going to balance my SO4 as though it were an individual thing. I mean, it is an individual thing. So I look over here, I have one sulfate, and I have one sulfate over here. So those are just naturally balanced. Then I'm going to ba balance my nonmetals that do not include oxygen or hydrogen. I always save my oxygen and hydrogen for the very, very end. So I see here I have a carbon. I have two carbons. Over here I only have one carbon, so I'm going to put a two out front like that. And then when it comes to balancing oxygen and hydrogen, which one of these do you do first? Well, in truth, it doesn't really matter. I typically just do the first one that I get to. So in this case, I got to my hydrogen first. So I've got two hydrogens here, and then I have two hydrogens here for a total of four hydrogens on the reactant side. And over here I have um, water is my only hydrogen source. And I've got two of them, so I'm going to put a two up front to give me a total of four hydrogens. Now I'm going to balance my oxygens. My oxygens here I don't have to worry about because I balance them as part of the sulfate. So I only have to worry about these oxygens where I have six oxygens and these oxygens where I have another four for a grand total of ten. So, oh, whoopsie, ha, scratch that. Um, I have six oxygens on the reactant side. There's an arrow right here. Um, so on this side, I have these four oxygens here, and I have two oxygens here for a grand total of six, so the reaction is balanced. Um, if I were to write this as a net ionic equation, my aqueous substances, if they were ionic, would ionize. So I would rewrite this as two hydrogen ions and a sulfate ion. This is a solid, so it stays. This is a gas, it stays. This is a liquid, it stays. This one's aqueous, so I separate it into two sodiums and a sulfate. And anything that stays the same on both sides of the equation gets crossed out. So I had a sulfate over here and a sulfate over here. So if I were to write this as a net ionic equation, it would just be, and this is gone, it would be two hydrogen ions plus two sodium bicarbonates yields two carbon dioxides, two waters, and two sodiums. Oh, look at that. Everything has a two as a coefficient. So I could actually reduce that down and say one hydrogen plus one sodium bicarbonate yields one carbon dioxide, one water, and one sodium. 
Um, just a refresher on the types of reactions you can encounter. You can have a combination or synthesis reaction. The two words mean the same thing. That's where you have multiple reactants coming together to form a single product. Opposite of that is a decomposition where one reactant falls apart or decomposes into multiple products and they could be other compounds or it could be individual elements. You have a combustion reaction which is where any compound reacts with oxygen uh, and it can be any compound y'all. It doesn't have to be an organic compound. It, the formation of rust is technically a combustion because it's iron reacting with oxygen. So combustion is any time that you have something reacting with oxygen. Now can you have one reaction be multiple types? Of course. That one I was talking about where you take iron and react it with oxygen to produce, I'm just going to put rust because rust has a couple, it's like a mixture of different iron oxides. But regardless, this is a synthesis reaction, but it's also a combustion reaction. And that's okay. We're not going to use the term single replacement anymore. We're going to use terms like oxidation reduction or redox. Um, and we also don't use the term double replacement anymore. They're called either precipitation reactions or they could be called a neutralization reaction. We just get a little bit more specific. But um, topic four will cover all of those special kinds of single and double replacement reactions. Um, just a little bit of a refresher on vocabulary. Y'all can work through that. Just pause this and write it down if you feel like it. Percent composition, how do you calculate it? Well, it's the percent by mass of each element in a compound. So basically, just take the um, mass of an element divide it by the mass of the compound, and uh, multiply by 100 to get your percent composition. So here's an example. What's the percent composition of each element in Na2CO3, sodium carbonate? So to figure that out, the first thing that you need to do, I would suggest pausing and figuring this out on your own, um, doing that with all of these videos. Pause whenever you get to a question, work it on your own, and then hit play, and I'll work it out for you. Uh, first of all, the uh, molar mass of the sodium carbonate, you're going to take 2 times the mass of 22.99, which is the molar mass of sodium. You're going to add to that 12.01. And you're going to add to that 3 times 16. Three oxygens at 16 apiece. Uh, real quick to figure that out. 2 times 22.99 plus 12.01 plus 48 gives you a grand total of 105.99 grams per mole for the whole compound. Now for each individual element, the percentage of sodium is going to be the part that was sodium divided by this 105.99. So we'll take 2 times 22.99, whatever that was, 46 something, um, divide it by 105.99 and then you have to multiply that by 100 to make it a percentage. Yes, you actually have to write this times 100. They expect to see that anytime, they being the AP graders, anytime a question talks about a percentage, whether it's percent composition or percent yield or percent anything, they want to see this times 100 to show that you actually know what you're talking about. Um, and this works out to 43.4 percent. Carbon um, would be the 12.01 divided by the 105.99, and that's going to work out to 11.3%. And then the percentage of oxygen is going to be 3 times 16, or 48, divided by the 105.99, and that's going to work out to 45.3%. Yeah, that's right, 45.3%. And so that's the percent composition of each element in the sodium carbonate. Um, what you can do with that is take your empirical, you can find your empirical formula, which is just simply defined as the simplest ratio of elements in a compound. And specifically for ionic compounds, the empirical formula is the true formula because by definition, you write the formula for an ionic compound in the simplest ratio. Whereas for a molecular compound, it might be the formula or you might need to multiply it up a little bit. Best example I can think of is C6H12O6. Everybody knows, that's glucose. Obviously not written in the simplest ratio. If it were the simplest ratio, it would be CH2O, um, which is carbohydrate. Aha, isn't that cool? Um, but this would be the empirical formula 
for glucose. This would be its molecular formula or true formula. So for an ionic compound, the empirical is the real formula. And for a molecular compound, it may or may not be. You might have to take the empirical and multiply it by some number to get the molecular. The way that you get to the empirical formula from percent composition is convert to grams, convert to moles, and then um, to the simplest ratio. And I'm about to show you an example of each of these three things. Um, and this is what your lab is going to be based on, so be ready for that. So what is the empirical formula of a compound containing 68.4% chromium and the rest oxygen? So we know that our formula is CR something O something else. So to figure it out, we're going to take that 68.4% um, gives us 31.6% oxygen. And we're going to make an assumption. Since we're not actually working in a lab, um, we can pretend like we have however much of this compound that we want. And since we're working in percentages, the most logical mass to choose for our little make-believe setup here is 100 grams. Because if we have 100 grams of something that's 68.4% chromium, well, then we actually have 68.4 grams of chromium and 31.6 grams of oxygen. And then from there, since we want to know what the ratio is, mole to mole ratio of chromium to oxygen, we're going to convert these guys into moles. Molar mass of chromium is 52.00. Whoa, I don't know why I wrote a 5. 52.00 grams of chromium to every one mole. If you have no idea what this block setup is, you need to watch the pre-AP video on stoichiometry. So grams of chromium here and 68 divided by 52 gives us 1.315. I'll just say 1.32 for sig figs. Um, and that's moles of chromium. And then for our oxygen, we're going to take our 31.6 grams of oxygen, divide it by 16 grams of oxygen for every one mole. And that works out to 1.98 moles of oxygen. Now, whenever you have this, this is the mole ratio. But it's not the simplest mole ratio. For the simplest mole ratio, we need these two numbers to be whole numbers. So the first thing we're going to do, easily get this guy to a 1 by dividing both of them by 1.32. This is okay to do because this is make-believe land. And as long as we do something, whatever we do to one number, if we do it to the other number, we're all good. And so this works out to one mole of chromium, and this works out to actually one and a half moles of oxygen. So we're still not quite at, at a whole number. So to get this at a whole number, to take care of a 0.5, we multiply both of these by two. So we end up with two moles of chromium and three moles of oxygen, which tells me that my empirical formula for chromium oxide in this case is Cr2O3, where we were dealing with chromium 3 oxide. Now, molecular formula, if you're dealing with a molecular compound, uh, the molecular formula is going to be a multiple of the empirical formula. And the only thing that you need to get from the empirical formula to the molecular formula is a known molar mass of the compound like these. So we have a compound containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, 63.16 of carbon and 8.77% uh, hydrogen and then of course the rest would be oxygen. Give us the molar mass, they want to know what's the empirical formula and what's the molecular formula. So we'll solve for the empirical formula the same way that we just did by taking these percentages, assuming that we have 100 grams of the compound and then converting them to moles. So the 63.16 grams of carbon, divide that by the 12.01 grams per mole. And that works out to uh, 5.26 uh, moles of carbon. And for the hydrogen, we take the 8.77 grams of hydrogen divided by 1.01 .01 grams per mole. And that works out to 8.77. Huh, 8.77. Ah. Actually, I don't think it does. 
uh, 8.68. It's not really that different. And then for the oxygen, we're going to take 100, because that would be the total percentage, subtract the carbon, subtract the hydrogen, and you get 28.07% oxygen or 28.07 grams of oxygen. And again, convert it to moles. And you get for oxygen 1.75. So now to figure out our empirical formula, take all three of these, divided by the smallest one, which would be 1.75. And it works out to, uh, this one is three, this is five, and this is one. So our empirical formula is C3H5O. Now to figure out what the actual formula is, we're going to figure out the molar mass of this guy and compare it to our true molar mass. So the molar mass of this guy, I'm just going to estimate this because that works. So 12 plus 5 plus 16. Huh, not 12, it'd be 18. No, wait. Carbon is 12, so this would be 36. Sorry, having a brain fart. So 36 plus 5 is 41, plus 16 is 57. So 57 is exactly half of 114, so that means that this formula is exactly half of the true formula. So I'm just going to multiply this guy by 2. So the molecular formula is C6H10O2. And I think at that point I'm going to go ahead and call this one quits and start a second show because it's getting a little long.